Well, welcome everyone. It is my absolute pleasure to um, welcome Brandy Buenafe. She's from the California State Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Uh, she is their principal librarian and she's sharing uh, some of her evening with us tonight so that you all can learn about getting started in state service. So we're wonderful. it's wonderful to have you with us, Brandy. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. I know that these sessions at the end of a long day can be a lot. So I really appreciate you coming um, and giving me a chance to talk about something that is really important to me, which is the often hidden world of correctional librarianship and um, state librarianship in general. Um, there are literally hundreds of state agencies and you find librarians in the darndest places, not what, you know, Water Resources Board has librarians um, and we have librarians in corrections. So just a quick roadmap for tonight. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about me um, and my experiences and what brought me to where I am today. I'm gonna give a brief history of CDCR libraries. They've undergone many changes over the years. I'm gonna talk about what I call our multi-purpose libraries. Um, correctional libraries are often referred to as a special library. And I find that um, multi-purpose is a better word for us. So we'll talk about that. I'm gonna share a slide about why you should consider CDCR actually had a really great conversation with a recent iSchool graduate um, who is a librarian for us now. And she shared a lot of what she found attractive about CDCR. And I wanted to share that with you. Then I'm going to talk about our two-step hiring process. Um, I think sometimes one of the things that stands in the way of working for CDCR is the daunting aspect of jumping through the hoops to do the hiring process. So I'm gonna try and make that as simple as I can tonight. And then we'll have questions. The final slide will have my contact info on it. And um, this is being recorded and the slide deck will be available later. So you'll have my contact information if you have questions that come up after the fact, um, or if you try the hiring process and you have questions as you go, I'm always welcome to or happy to help. Okay, so a little bit about me. So I am an iSchool graduate. I graduated in 2007. Um, the program was a hybrid program then. We had some classes on campus and some online. Um, and my year was one of the first years that you could either write a thesis or do a portfolio. And I found the portfolio very exciting. Um, and new at the time and a way to show my competency. So that's what I did. But um, that was in 2007. And I, during my time at San Jose State, I took a class in correctional librarianship. It was offered in the summer. And one of the um, aspects of it was to look at the hiring process for CDCR. So I sort of stumbled my way through that um, and was lucky enough to receive an offer um, for a position they held for me until I graduated. And two weeks after I graduated, I started at Corcoran State Prison, which is in the Central Valley. Corcoran State Prison is a level four institution. Um, that's our highest security level. Um, but we had... Libraries, like I'll talk about when I get to the multi-purpose libraries, um, for all, all of our incarcerated um, patrons, um, the whole, the whole universe of possible patrons, everyone is entitled to the library. So it's a program that has a far-reaching aspect um, and can have some challenges. Um, the the housing status of some individuals makes it challenging to get them into the library. So it takes a little bit of creativity sometimes, but I did that for five years as a librarian. Um, then I promoted to senior librarian and I was at Pleasant Valley State Prison, which is also in the Central Valley. 
Um, I was there for just two years, and this position at the Office of Correctional Education became available to be the principal librarian um, and sort of oversee the pro professional development, um, purchasing, programming, um, just support role um, that librarians in the field need. And I've been doing that for 10 years this month, um, which is amazing to me that it's been so long, but it really has been a dream job. So that's what brings us to today. Let's bring up to today our CCR libraries. So before the 1970s, there were some books available, some legal materials available. The um, vision that a lot of people have of correctional libraries is um, often colored by movies like The Shawshank Redemption. That is how it was um, before the 1970s. Things, materials were available sort of haphazardly. Um, there was not a lot of funding um, and legal materials were also available, but were sort of sporadic. So that all changed in 1977 in a California, excuse me, a United States Supreme Court case called Bounds v. Smith, which I should have put the citation, but um, that was a lawsuit that was brought by incarcerated persons who said that their rights to appeal their criminal convictions and the conditions of their confinement were being violated because they didn't have legal assistance. And the Supreme Court ruled that states had to either provide law libraries in their correctional institutions or provide um, legal representation to the incarcerated population. Most states, including California, selected law libraries to fulfill that mandate. Um, in another uh, iteration of my life, I went to law school for a memorable semester um, before realizing I didn't want to be a lawyer. But in Utah, where I went to law school, they, they had um, third year law students who assisted um, folks who were incarcerated. So they had a different model than California. California is a big state with a large population, um, a large incarcerated population, and it just made more sense to have law libraries. So the department moved along with providing law libraries. And then in 2005, we had a paradigm shift this was right before I started with the department, but they added rehabilitation to the mission of CDCR. That's the R in CDCR is rehabilitation. We used to just be CDC, the Department of Corrections. Um, but with the added emphasis on rehabilitation, there was a bigger push for more, um, more programming, more creative ways of um, making sure that folks left our institutions um, prepared for life in the community. And then in 2014, right around the time that I started at the Office of Correctional Education, we um, a bill was passed that allowed for face-to-face -face community college instruction to happen inside of our institutions. That has blossomed over the past decade um, we have uh, seven bachelor's programs now and one master's degree program. Um, our superintendent likes to say that we cover everything from grade school to grad school because we have adult education as well for folks that are looking to get their GED or finish their high school diploma. But then they have all the options of moving on to college. Um that has really re adding rehabilitation to the mission and um, the 
advent of college programming have really affected um, the libraries and their relationship to the institution, their relationship to our incarcerated patrons, um, and just what we're able to do. So our multi-purpose libraries, I call them multi-purpose because they fulfill several roles. Um, in the library, you might have a college student working on a laptop, reading an article that they have downloaded from EBSCO um, in preparation for doing a report. You might have a person who is working in um, on the computer, uh, looking up information about their um, legal case uh, using LexisNexis. And then you have people who are in the library to come to book club or a writing group, or just to check out the newest books. Those all happen simultaneously and our librarians um, wear many hats. So I have them listed here as like a school or academic library, a recreational library, and then a legal library. Um, we do a little bit of everything and we do it at the same time. So you might, your reference questions um, will run the gamut and um, that gives you a chance to provide services to the whole population. So in the community, there might be people that would go to an academic library go to a public library, go to a community law library, but in an institution, that's all the same space. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the benefits of working with CDCR. The one that stood out to me the most when I started were the benefits, the healthcare and retirement. Um, we all know that in our uh, environment, they can be challenging to have defined benefits like that. So we're really lucky. Um, and that's a point that I like to make. The other thing that stands out to me is that we have full-time set schedules. Um, I see a lot of times folks that are hiring for libraries and the position is part-time or on call um, and the schedule might be described as flexible. Um, our institutions follow a school schedule mostly. So we're, it's mostly a Monday through Friday um, job. Some institutions are open on Saturdays. Um, but those, that full-time opportunity I think is, is important. And then the fact that we're in a secure environment. Um, in Sacramento, a couple of years ago, we had a death of a library staff person at one of our public libraries, um, which was shocking to the community. And really, I found kind of highlighted a, a feeling, of a little bit of angst or anxiousness around the security of libraries. Um, I felt this at conferences that I've attended and I've attended sessions where they talk about um, how to build relationships with your local police department and, and things like that. And in CDCR, we work in what we call a secure environment. Um, there are correctional officers who are assigned to either to your library or to the area that you work in. Um, 
who are honestly ready at a moment's notice to offer assistance. Um, you have a personal alarm that you wear on your belt. And as someone who's pushed my alarm on accident before, they come quickly to <laughs> offer their assistance. Um, even if you're standing there red faced saying I accidentally bumped it on the copier machine, but they're there for you. Um, and I think that that is something that's really valuable. And then I think of our libraries as a great first library job, fresh out of school. If you want to come to understand the different types of librarianship, um, a special library that's like ours where it's a multi-purpose library is a really good opportunity to get experience in programming, experience in purchasing and cataloging, um, experience working with people um, with legal concerns or folks that are working on college level research. Um, you just wear a lot of hats and get a lot of experience that I think can really ground people in librarianship for the future. So I wanted to spend some time talking about the hiring process. So let's say that at the end of this presentation, you think about it and you think, you know what, I'm going to check it out. So the first thing that happens is that there is an application for the examination. And I have the website on the screen. Um, this is where our process of what they call getting on the list comes from. And that is a system where you apply, you take an, an assessment and we, and your rank with your experience and your education um, to be eligible to be hired. It's sort of like creating a candidate pool. The examination process is, um, can be a challenge. I think that we, it's a self-assessment, right? So it asks you how much experience you have doing X, Y, or Z. And I think that as um, people, sometimes we sell ourselves short with our experience. Um, when it talks about budgeting, you know, we do that in our personal life. So our lived experiences are valuable also to consider when you're completing an examination like that. Um, so that process happens. It's 2024 and it still happens with a paper exam. So that turnaround time can be um, a lot. Um, but within about four to six weeks, you'll get a letter in the mail, you know, congratulations, your rank, whatever. I was rank four when I did my first exam um, and thought, oh, that doesn't seem very good. But the next step that happens is that people with openings will send you letters um, inviting you to apply for their opening. You can also go to Cal Careers and search for open positions and submit an application there as well. Um, that process for applying for specific jobs happens after you're on the hiring list. Um, I know I just sort of skimmed the surface of that whole process, but um, during the q and I'm well, happy to answer more questions about that. And that's where we've come to. That was shorter than I expected. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions and to um, 
just assist. I, I've got my email address up here. Honestly, if you have questions after the fact, um, please reach out. If you just need a little mentoring, please reach out. I'm always happy to connect with fellow iSchool alumni and um, and give give a boost. So that's what that's all I've got for today. Awesome, Brandy. Okay, folks, so now is the time for you to drop your questions in the Q&A. You should be able to find that from the ribbon at the bottom of your window. And while we're waiting, I guess, oh, we have our first question has come in. So first question is, is there a minimum or maximum age to work within the library? There is not. There is a minimum education requirement. Um, you have to have um, completed at least a year of um, the master's in library science. So I think that um, whatever age that gets people is what happens. But I have seen people as young as 21 or 22. Um, and as old as people in their 70s um, working for us. And uh, some of them were second careers for people. Um, we're also often, like I said, a, a entry-level position as well. That's a good question. Okay, great. Um, on to the next question. How difficult is the qualification exam? Would it be feasible for a current MLIS student to take and pass it? Yes. So it's, I think that the exam is not um, difficult in that the scoring is challenging. You really just want to, it'll ask you questions like, um, I wish I had one in front of me. I could read you an actual question, but it'll ask questions like, what is your experience with selecting materials for a library? Now, we know that there's a lot of project-based learning at the iSchool, which is um, excellent. So you might have done a mock, it had a mock experience of selecting materials for a library. Um, or you might have experience, uh, working in a library, but even if you don't, I, I didn't have any experience working in a library when I started. Um, I did my internship, um, with an, uh, bookmobile and that was all the library experience I had. And I was able to, um, successfully navigate the exam, um, and I was a current student at the time. The exam has changed over the years. We really have made it more about your lived experiences now so that you're able to bring into it experiences and um, qualifications that you have from other positions, other customer service jobs, um, that kind of thing. Okay, great. Um, we'll get to the next question in the Q&A. What experiences during your time at the iSchool have been helpful for your CDCR CR career, courses, internships, workshops, projects, anything you recommend for current students? Yeah, the um, projects that I found the most valuable were the ones where you created something for a mock library. So um, writing a collection development plan, um, really thinking about um, what, how you would spend budget monies um, on materials. Um, the class on correctional librarianship was amazing and is still offered. So if you have room in your schedule for an elective like that, um, they have a requirement now to 
um, visit an institution and talk to a librarian. And I help facilitate those connections every year. Um, let's see, I would definitely take advantage of opportunities for internships or practicums. Um, like I said, I worked with an outreach librarian and we helped set up book circles at um, assisted living facilities and getting that experience of bringing the library to the community, I found to be really valuable um, and helpful when I was, when I'm looking at people who um, maybe are in our restricted housing units at the institution and we need to bring the library to them because they can't come out of their cell. Um, so just leveraging their tablets for eBooks or, um, you know, putting, we worked to put the full Lexus library on those tablets. So things like that, I found the internship was really helpful. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Um, do you partner with DOD SkillBridge? I do not. I haven't heard of that before. Um, if you want to share a little bit more about that or send me an email, I can see if that's something that we might be able to do. Okay, thank you for sharing your career journey with us. I'm in Los Angeles. Are there CDCR libraries near me where I might be able to get on a list to work? Yes, we have in the Los Angeles area, we have three institutions um, that are in the sort of Inland Empire, Chino, that area. We have an institution in Lancaster. And then as you go further south, there are more as well. Um, San Diego area, the desert like that. Um, but yeah, we have institutions and we, um, you can select when you are completing your application for the examination, you can select where you'd like to work in California. You can select by county um, or by individual institution if you know the ones that are near you. And then um, that will you would only receive interest letters from institutions that you selected or in, or in the counties that you selected. Um, if you are able to uh, relocate, um, we have a lot of institutions that sort of run up and down the Central Valley, um, but we do have ones in the Los Angeles area. Um, the next attendee wanted to know um, if they live in San Francisco and cannot re relocate, is there a way for me to know what locations have positions available? I think we kind of covered that, right? Uh, the um, I would go to, just to get a taste for it, even before you do the examination, I would go to the Cal Careers and do a keyword search for librarian and just see the places that have um, openings. You can kind of get a feel for what um, what's out there. Um, San Francisco, we have um, San Quentin Rehabilitation Center, which is actually going through a fantastic change. There, um, there's a movement in California um, called the California Model which is to bring normalization to our institutions. The idea being that if folks have spent years in an, um, a highly regimented institutionalized environment, it is more challenging for them to transition to living in the community again. And something like 95% of our uh, incarcerated population will release back to the community. So um, making sure that transition is smooth is important. And 
um, one of the pillars of the California model is normalization. And they're building a new library at San Quentin that is very open um, and that has, you know, the latest and greatest technology and um, has, it seems like a small thing, but it has open stacks. So many of our libraries, especially our older institutions, have closed stacks where folks have to negotiate with the clerk to get access to the material. Um, that mindset that people can't be trusted with books um, is, is thankfully moving out of the way. And um, we're in a position now where we're able to say, you know, we trust you to pick your reading material. We trust you to be um, mindful and careful of it. Um, it's just a really exciting time to work at San Quentin. So that's, that's San Francisco adjacent. Okay, great. The next question is, uh, what types of jobs can current students apply to? And then can you go into like the different levels of classifications for the positions that you have? Yeah, of course. So in CDCR, we hire three classifications. We hire library technical assistants, we hire librarians, and we hire senior librarians. Um, a library technical assistant requires some library experience um, or an AA in library science. Um, the librarian position just requires you to have completed a year of um, library school. So we have students that work for us. Um, and then senior librarian is a position that you can get um, after you've worked for the department for two years. Um, often a senior librarian so let me describe a typical library setup. So at our institutions, we have um, individual yards, they're called, and they're like little self-contained um, towns within the institution that have um, a program office, a gym, um, a store, a uh, a space for meals, a housing units, and an education department, including a library. So the individual libraries on each yard, there might be four or five of them are um, run by librarians and library technical assistants. And then you would have one senior librarian at each institution that kind of oversees that program, um, make sure that there's a schedule for when people can come to the library, um, interacts. I mostly interact with senior librarians at my level um, to answer questions about purchasing, um, about professional development opportunities, that sort of thing. They're really kind of a liaison between the institution and the um, our Office of Correctional Education. Um, in state service in general, because I want to remind you that there are positions at um, other state agencies, they have um, supervising librarians, which is a classification that we don't have, but I have colleagues who started as librarians with us and then moved into other state agencies as supervising librarians. So that promotional path might take you out of CDCR, but um, keeps you in state service with the um, just the great benefits. Did that answer the question? That was fantastic. I think that really okay. gave us um, a big picture. Um, as well as kind of like a slice of day in the life. Um, I'm sure we'll have more questions on that. So the next question is, is your library system independent or do you share resources with regional or county libraries? No, we're independent. Um, 
that is sometimes good and sometimes bad. Um, I One of the hats that I wear is I'm on the board of the California Library Association, and we'll talk about um, public library grants. And those are not something that my libraries are eligible for because we're not um, a public library. So our resources come um, from the state budget uh, in times. So we have lean years and fat years. Um, we're actually in a really good, healthy position right now. Um, we were able to secure funding based on our population. So institutions with more um, incarcerated people received more funding this year. Um, that's the first time that we've been able to tie it like that. So the funds are spread out a little more equitably. Um, but the, so regionally local libraries, we don't really partner with them, except that there are some really innovative programs. San Francisco Public Library has a jail and reentry services department, and they answer um, questions that are written to them by incarcerated patrons. Um, and they run the gamut of the kinds of reference questions that they ask, but they answer a lot of questions um, for our population. And um, we also work with some nonprofits um, to talk about San Quentin again, they've got a friends group, which is the first in the state. It's actually run by um, an iSchool graduate. Um, so they're able to get additional materials for some really innovative programming. Um, they especially do some crafting that just allows for self-expression on the part of the patrons, um, which is a valuable part of their rehabilitation. Um, and then statewide, we're working with an organization from Connecticut called Freedom Reads. Um, Freedom Reads is was founded by a formerly incarcerated man, and his vision is to have um, capsule libraries in every housing unit of every prison in the United States. And in California, we have these um, 500 title collections at three of our institutions, and we're gonna have it in a fourth um, October the 9th as they're coming back out to set up more um, libraries. So in that way, we're able to partner with them. We get the resources of these books, um, which are everything from classic titles to YA, um, to some good nonfiction, um, we're able to receive those materials um, because our missions align. So that, that way of reaching out to the community, I found has been more sustainable for us than working with actual other libraries. Okay, fantastic. I see that we have two more questions that came in through the webinar chat. So let's get to those. And then I think I have a few, I have a few questions too. Yeah. So Valerie asks, what kind of experience would you recommend I can get to stand out more from other candidates? Any kind of experience you have with um, the law is really valuable. Um, so if you're looking at an internship, you might consider something with a public law library. Um, our mission, our, our overarching reason for being remains that 1977 court decision that established the law libraries in our institutions. We've used that in California as sort of our foot in the door to open up for wider library opportunities. Um, and we offer all the different services that I've talked about tonight. Um, but that law library tends to come up in interview questions, um, tends to come up 
when people are looking at your experience. So that's one thing that I would say. Great. And then Floyd asks, I live out of the country. What locations are available to take the exam? So the exam is online. Um, so you can just print it out and send it in. Um, it's a self-assessment. Um, when, let me see if I can arrow back. No. Okay, well, never mind. Um, when you look at the assessment, you can complete it and mail it. It has a mailing address that it goes to. Um, you would be fine. Uh, I've even seen, so that'd be fine to get on the list. And then I've seen folks do phone interviews. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities um, to connect with us, even if you're outside of the country. So piggybacking on that, Brandy, if they're offered a phone interview, can you walk us through the next steps as far as, um, you know, are candidates usually invited out to the facility? And then is there some sort of training period, probationary period, or sort of, um, you know, introductory phase of getting hired? Yeah. So um, after the interview, um, you would receive a job offer. Um, and then there is a step where you, we have background checks, um, to work in the institution. So that process would happen. And then you'd be onboarded at the institution. Um, there is institution specific onboarding, um, which talks about sort of how to engage with the incarcerated, um, talks about just what it's like to work at an institution, that kind of thing. And then there's um, education department and library specific um, onboarding too. We um, try to offer folks a mentor um, someone who's worked for the department for a while that's able to answer questions. Um, and honestly, the, the pandemic was valuable for us in that it forced us on to Teams. And we have Teams channels and chats now that are um, statewide. So library staff can get real-time answers to questions um, kind of in the moment in a way that we used to, you just send out an email and maybe somebody would get to it when they saw it. And, um, this way questions can be answered really on the fly, um, which has been exciting for me. Oh, that's great. Okay, let's get to another question that's come in through the Q&A. Do CDCR libraries directly collaborate with the educational institutions that provide degree programs for incarcerated people? Yeah, so um, we communicate most often with the with our counterparts at the institution. Um, excuse me, at the degree granting institution at the college. Um, so I've had conversations with um, academic librarians about, um, especially before we were able to provide um, incarcerated access to EBSCO directly. For a couple years, we had like a research request form that the patron would complete. Um, and then the library staff would do, you know, some simple searches and provide some articles. You can see how that is not um, an optimal experience for the student. Um, learning how to do research is an important part of being a college student. And so doing your own research, um, I answer a lot of questions for academic librarians about just sort of what databases we have, that kind of thing. Um, the education department that the library is a part of 
has a um, college coordinator that really helps to make sure that college students are signed up for the right classes, that sort of thing. Um, there's advising services, um, getting people to make sure that they're taking the right classes so that they can transfer to a four-year institution um, or move on with their studies. And that is an area that is a growth area for us. Um, we, t we have, as libraries, have not been as actively involved in the day-to-day -day student um, environment as we could be. We mostly just serve as a resource for people um, who are doing research for their coursework, but being more actively involved is something that we're looking into for the future. Wonderful. Okay, I'm looking to see if there are any more questions. So I had a few questions and I'll start with um, what would you say, Brandy, are a few um, soft skill sort of personal attributes that you feel would make um, an applicant or a, a correctional librarian a good candidate for this type of work? So personal attributes or soft skills? Yeah, I think it's crucial to have a developed sense of empathy um, and be able to draw healthy boundaries um, while serving your population with compassion is very important. Um, we see people um, who are at all stages of their life um, we have, you know, 16 and 17 year olds who are incarcerated for the first time up to we have hospice services um, for end of life care for um, our aging population. So we see people at all ages and they are with us for a variety of reasons. And it's important to be able to acknowledge that behavior occurred and still interact with them on a human level. Um, so developing that empathy and compassion is important. And then being able to draw those boundaries is really important. Um, you want to be friendly, but not overly familiar with your patrons. And that's a skill that is valuable in any kind of library. Um, honestly. Other soft skills, um, just communication is real important. We actually offer a course called Transformative Correctional Communication to our library staff that really helps um, folks learn how to talk to their colleagues and talk to their patrons um, in a way that keeps it about the transactions that are occurring and not maybe as personal as it can get. Um, soft skills. Maybe an attribute too would be if you were just a, you know, a person who was curious about or passionate about um, the justice involved. Um, this is a real way to make a difference in people's lives um, in a concrete way. And I personally have a history of incarceration in my family. And this has been, this career has been a way for me to create opportunities that didn't necessarily exist in the past for family members. So um that kind of sense of wanting to make a difference, I think is important too. Thank you, that's very powerful. Okay, we had another question come in the Q&A and it is, can I still apply now if I'm currently in my first year of my MLIS? I will be done with my first year at the end of this semester, but I'm not sure if that counts. Yes. So you can apply for the list. Um, you can do the examination. 
You can get on the list. You can be interviewed. You just can't be appointed to the position until you've completed your first year. So you can do all that um, front-loaded work. You can do all of that during your first year. And it honestly, it might be a good experience just to, you know, even if you're on the fence about working for the department, just going through the application process um, will is a valuable experience with learning about um, how a large bureaucracy hires. I think that will be helpful um, no matter what kind of library you end up in. Very good. Very good suggestions. Let's see, I'm checking to see if we have any more questions that have come in. I did want to ask, um, are there professional organizations specific to correctional librarianship that folks need to know about? Yeah, there there aren't. Um, we tend to be sort of discover each other um, online. I know that um, if folks are on Facebook, the ALA think tank will often have people who will be like, I'm a correctional librarian. Where are my people? Mm -hmm. People can respond and um, reach out to each other that way. Um, I found it valuable just to be a part of CLA um, and ALA. ALA has, they just recently released um, new standards for services to the incarcerated. Um, and they have a, um, a, what do they call it? A round table or a group that is specific to correctional librarianship. Um, you often have people who are also in public libraries who work with reentry services. So once our once our patron leaves um, our institution and goes into the community, there can be services offered to them through the public library. And that kind of warm handoff is is important. And so making connections with public librarians um, just through CLA membership or ALA membership is um, really beneficial. And you just get good ideas, right? Um, often with a little tweaking, a program idea that you learn about at a conference would work in a correctional library if you just changed a couple things about it or or something like that. So um, just being part of the wider library community, I think is really valuable. Fantastic. And are some, like what percentage of your institutions would you say are specific to like juvenile populations versus adults? So we have, um, so in California, um, a couple of years ago, they changed the model for juvenile um, incarceration and that's run now through the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, our institutions are for adults um, but we have people who are, you know, in their teens up through um, 25 that are involved in the Youth Offender Program, or YOP, and that is at um, Valley State Prison in Chowchilla, which is in the Central Valley. Um, that program is really designed to make sure to kind of offer wraparound services for juveniles um, who are often serving a shorter term sentence um, to, to keep them from recidivating and coming back to the institution. Cause that's our goal, right? Is to put ourselves out of business. Um, we want people to not, not come to us. And if they do, to, if they do to leave us and stay gone. So um the youth offender program is really just a really interesting program. Um, and they offer like communal living. There'll be like a, a certain housing unit that they'll all live in, um, take classes together, that kind of thing. Um, but that's at that institution. Um, and then I believe that, so we have two women's facilities and I believe that there's a youth offender program at um, one of those facilities as well. 
but that's that's a good question. We have 30 institutions and our youth are kind of um, all housed at just a couple of them. Okay, so it does sound like it makes sense to first get on the list and then, like you said, wait to see who you're contacted by, but also you can check out the list of openings. Yes. What other questions do folks have? We have about five more minutes with Brandy. This has been a fascinating hour. We're so glad to have you with us. Okay, oh, we do have another pleasure. question. Do librarians get crisis training? Yeah, so one of the most valuable trainings that we've done has been, um, oh, Dowd is his last name, Ryan Dowd, I believe, who actually his work was with homeless. But um, that the lessons that we learned from that training about de-escalation um, about interacting with people that have mental health issues um, was really just great. Um, the correctional communication training I talked about works a lot with sort of bringing down the temperature in a conversation. Um, the department is also very mindful of how there it can be there can be trauma involved with our work trauma with our population but also just sort of residual or transferred trauma with our staff um you are working in a prison and that environment can take a toll sometimes so they offer great um employee assistance program um and I found the peer to peer um, services to be really helpful too. Um, I had, I'll just tell a story. I had an incident in a library that I worked in at Corcoran um, where two people got in a fight in my library. And so the officers came and, um, that's the first time that I'd ever really been close to people being handcuffed or, um, you know, that, that whole charged up environment. Um, and I needed to sit and talk with somebody and sort of process through what I had witnessed, um, just as a, as a relatively introverted person, that kind of high level High intensity was a lot to take at first. So um, that was my experience with that. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Well, once again, Brandy, we really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you so much for your care in answering all the questions of our students. Again, this recording will be available on the iSchools YouTube channel under the Student Services and Outreach playlist in a couple of weeks. Um, okay, we're getting some thanks coming through. So Wonderful. any closing thoughts, Brandy? Oh, just that I hope that you'll, as you move through your um, career, that you'll consider correctional librarianship um, or consider if you find yourself working in a different kind of library, just thinking about reentry services. Um, California has 100,000 people, roughly. I think it's 97,000, but um, incarcerated. And like I said, those are going to be our future neighbors. And um, I think that taking the opportunity to assist in their rehabilitation, um, especially in the library context, is just really important. So and thank you so much for having me. This was great. You're most welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, and have a great evening.